Good morning. I'd like to welcome people uh, who have joined us and thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. Uh, we're really excited about the webinar that we have to present today. I think it's an opportunity to launch some important work across Canada. I'm Roy Cameron, Executive Director of Homewood Research Institute, and I'd like to make a few brief comments for context. Homewood Research Institute is an internet and nationally registered charity. It has a really unique mission and vision. I'd encourage you to go to our website uh, to, for more details. But in brief, the things that set us apart is that our focus is not discovery research, but improving lives. Our definition of research is very broad to include innovation, development, and evaluation, as well as applied research. And the third distinguishing feature is that we approach uh, our work in a spirit of collaboration. We're not in competition with other centers, but we really seek to bring people together across the country to do work that enhances our collective impact. Uh, our programs are led by independent scientists. Uh, so our applied research programs, for example, are led by uh, Margaret McKinnon from um, McMaster and Ruth Lanius from Western. They work in the PTSD area. James McKillop at McMaster leads our addiction program. Our evaluation program is led by Jean Costello, who's with us at the core unit at HRI, and Brian Rush. Um, and our uh, digital program is led by Yuri uh, Quintana, who's at Harvard. Our, we've got innovations going in two areas, and I'd like to make the innovation focus central here today. One area of focus is a uh, system for evaluating outcomes. Uh, of treatment programs, and we developed that system in partnership with Homewood Health, which is our uh, provides a research and development site for us. And Brian and Jean have led that work. Brian will say a bit more about that later. We've also focused in the digital space doing innovation work under Yuri's leadership. And we want to thank the RBC Foundation for their funding of the work that you're about to hear about today. Uh, to get down to it, I'd like to introduce three people who will uh, provide um, some context for the presentation today. Brian Rush. Brian is a senior scientist at Homewood Research Institute, and he's also a scientist emeritus at CAMH. Uh, Michelle Rossi, who's executive lead at Mental Health and Addiction Center of Excellence of Ontario, and Paul Kurdiak, who's the clinical lead at the Center of Excellence in Ontario. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Roy, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, pretty excited about this um, webinar. Uh, certainly excited about Yuri joining our group recently, and um, this is a bit of a launch for, for his work. So as Roy mentioned, my role at HRI is um, within the evaluation portfolio. And I've been engaged there now for several years. I must say I've enjoyed the collaborative spirit and also Roy's leadership and working with Margaret and James, but I worked most closely with Jean and now uh, Yuri on the evaluation side of things. I think probably I could make the biggest understatement of the webinar by saying Yuri's work is timely. Of course, we're all dealing with COVID and uh, the fallout from that and the shift in services um, that's underway really across the country, uh, in particular a shift towards more virtual uh, support. And um, I think it's important, although I think it's important to think of COVID as an accelerator because these trends have been really underway for quite some time towards digital tools. And this has become um, more important, but was really uh, part of the HRI portfolio and thinking for some time, uh, especially in the mental health space for youth. So COVID is really just an accelerator. And I think it's worth saying it's both an opportunity and a risk. Um, it's an opportunity because it kind of puts innovation front and center, like we have to change. Uh, the, there's no question about that. But also the risk is associated with the speed with which we are changing. And if we're not evaluating outcomes at multiple levels, and these multiple levels include access to services, transition across services, uh, 
continuity of care, impact on therapeutic relationship, retention in service, which as many people on the call will know is a big challenge in the substance use sector, and of course, recovery outcomes. So if we're not really paying attention to the, uh, the extent to which these apps are both effective and also efficient in the sense of kind of fitting into the, not only the person's journey, but also the, the extent to which their health information is traveling with them. Uh, this is a big issue within the virtual sector around confidentiality, et cetera. And maybe Paul and others are gonna comment a bit more on that. So the work is timely, but um, COVID is really just the accelerator. Um, the focus on outcomes, a bit of a segue, I'll pick up on Roy's comment about the work we've been doing and I'm actually very uh, proud of within the HRI context is the work on recovery monitoring with Gene and others there. So this work built out from work that I had started at, um, at CAMH and is now fully implemented within the Homewood Health context for their um, addiction uh, medicine services. We have implemented a, uh, a post-discharge, quote-unquote post-discharge follow-up system using state-of-the-art measures. And I think it's worth pointing out the work that we did. And uh, again, I really want to a shout out for Jean and others drawing upon the experience of the clients in the addiction program on what recovery meant to them and, and incorporating that into the measurement process. We've also seen the whole outcome monitoring system as a quality improvement project over time, not only using the results, but improving how we're doing and including the use of uh, technology in that process. So that work is now ready for wider dissemination. We're uh, really, really um, excited about the level of interest we've seen uh, outside of uh, our environment within HRI, both provincially and nationally the level of interest in expanding that work outside. And we've got a lot of uh, work underway. And I, uh, kind of the stakeholder consultation process, both provincially and at environmental scan nationally. So I just finished by, again, noting the collaborative spirit, the uh, extent to which we've all enjoyed working together on these different initiatives and welcoming Yuri into the, into the network at HRI. And I'm sure you're all going to really enjoy the presentation today. He's uh, top notch. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and uh, and then from there over to Paul. So thanks, everybody. Enjoy the enjoy the webinar. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and thanks to uh, uh, HRI and the team for having Paul and I here today. Um, we're really glad to be able to participate in this discussion and this kind of to all the points that Brian made. This really. Uh, you know, timely uh, framework coming out around evaluating apps for mental health and addictions for all the all the current reasons. I think this has really been brought to the um, the forefront uh, during the pandemic. So, um, growing, I think, a growing uh, area of interest before, but um, to Brian's point, certainly accelerated during this time. Uh, so we, we thought we'd say a few words about um, what is a very new mental health and addictions um, center of excellence situated within a very new um, health agency in, in Ontario. Uh, so bo both of these entities, um, relatively new fixtures uh, here in the health landscape um, in Ontario. Uh, Ontario Health is a new agency. It was formed from the integration of the existing uh, health agencies in the province. So, so far we've had six agencies integrated under the, the new banner over the past kind of roughly six months um, and likely another you know 14 or 15 agencies uh, to come so this has been a huge sort of integration um, effort of the provincial health agencies so um, i'm originally from health quality ontario and uh, some of my colleagues who have kind of integrated under um, ontario health so far are our, our cancer care agency uh, Health Force Ontario, which is a um, HHR kind of recruitment um, capacity planning agency. Uh, the Ontario Telemedicine Network uh, has come in with us and my colleagues there have seen a huge uh, boom in interest in uh, virtual care. OTN supports a platform here in Ontario for delivery of virtual care. And, um, you know, I think in March they had something like 700 requests to uh, create accounts on their platform and uh, 
uh, in February, sorry, and I, th I think in March they, they had over 10,000 requests. So uh, a really booming area of interest for care delivery now. Um, eHealth Ontario as well uh, is also under the, the uh, Ontario Health banner and soon to come are likely our organ transplantation uh, network and our local health integration networks are sort of regional health authorities here in Ontario. There are 14 kind of planning and funding agencies. So when we're all in, you know, Ontario Health has a very broad mandate um, to implement the government's health system strategies and to uh, manage health service needs across Ontario with an eye to quality and sustainability. So we're tasked with activities that many of us um, had in our mandates in our previous uh, agencies that I, I think overlap with a lot of work that many of you do around uh, performance measurement and management reporting, uh, setting evidence-based clinical and service standards, uh, quality improvement, knowledge translation, uh, data management, you know, lot, lots of other objects in, in, the, uh, in the act. And the agencies that have come in under Ontario Health uh, so far oversee several um, systems of clinical care like cancer, renal, uh, palliative home care. Uh, and then part of the mandate of Ontario Health is to support the implementation of the government's mental health and addiction strategy through the work of the centre. Uh, so the centre itself was established um, in law that was passed in February. Uh, 2020 and the government quickly followed this um, up at the beginning of March with their roadmap to wellness, which is the plan to build Ontario's mental health and addiction system. So you can find that roadmap on the ministry's website um, and, and, you know, essentially at its core, the centre is tasked with supporting the implementation of that roadmap. And as many of you will know, um, mental health and addictions care in Ontario isn't much of a system right now. Uh, many people in the province have long advocated for a focused effort to bring the same kind of attention and infrastructure to this part of healthcare uh, to support improved outcomes and patient, uh, client, and family experience. So the, the big opportunities in this strategy, as um, as we see them, are to you know first have a central point of oversight of the the mental health and addiction system in the province and. Uh, create some of those system building pieces. Paul will speak a bit more to this. Um, focus on bringing evidence to bear in the provision of mental health addiction services and then and then tying that expectation um, to, you know, uh, tying that to expectations around outcomes and experience. And, you know, lastly, we've had a, a divided um, system here between children and youth and adult. And I think we've got a new opportunity in the province to sort of smooth out um, that divide and better serve transitional aged youth. So I think especially these last two really tie into um, the topic that we're going to uh, that we're going to discuss today. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul just to say a few um, words about I've described the what and maybe Paul will talk a bit about the how. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. And thank you, uh, Roy and the Homewood team for inviting Michelle and me to present uh, and uh, obviously just echoing everybody else's sentiments that this is an extremely timely uh, topic for us to be wrapping our heads around. And just to build on, on some of what uh, Michelle talked about, I, I think one of the things that we are very preoccupied uh, by in, in the sort of newly established agency, the Center of Excellence, is system building writ large. And what that means is a, a series of of you know how questions so you know I, I do clinical work in a psychiatric emergency department in inner city Toronto and and one of the one of the common refrains that I hear is that uh, people ended up with coming to seek help in the emergency department precisely because they didn't know where else to go so one aspect of, of, of any sort of system building is how do we build systems so that people know where their right door is to, to enter once they're there, how do we align our services uh, so that it actually meets their needs with respect to the right sort of issue or diagnosis and the right intensity of, of need? Um, once we figure that out, how do we make sure that what we deliver to those individuals uh, both adheres to existing evidence and is delivered in a way that adheres to standards that align with that evidence? Um, how do we monitor response to treatment on an ongoing basis? Uh, and how do we build uh, information infrastructure to do so? Uh, how do we modify that treatment based on need and response to treatment? And finally, how do we collect information uh, around all of these activities to, in, to build what, what is being referred to as a rapid learning health system where 
inf meaningful information is routinely collected in the provision of care, but rolled up and, and used sort of iteratively and sort of a rapid quality improvement methodology to iteratively inform what is happening dynamically in, in, with respect to response to care. So that's sort of a high level overview of kind of the way we think about system building around mental health and addictions. And it's no different than system building in any other area of the healthcare system. I think there are sort of nuances that are unique to mental health and addictions that Michelle touched upon. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this is not just because it's a preoccupation of our center of excellence, but I think it's a really important point as we think about this webinar that uh, often when we think about apps, we think of the, about them in isolation. But we have to think about uh, ways in which apps can be utilized in a broader system so that people can get what they need uh, where, they, where and when they need it. Uh, and, and there's that alignment piece. It's, it's, um, it's not helpful to have an app that just sits in isolation and people may or may not be suitable for it so there, so it's not just about, and Yuri uh, had a really interesting discussion, I'm sure he's gonna to touch upon this with respect to his framework. It's not simply that an app adheres to evidence, but it is integrated into a broader sort of framework that allows individuals to successfully navigate their way into and out of the app uh, based on their needs. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the discussion today. Thank you again for uh, the invitation for us to uh, participate. And with that, I'll hand it back to Roy. Thanks so much, Brian, uh, Michelle, and Paul for this uh, beautiful setup for the presentation today. It really is very timely, I think, with COVID uh, making it clear that we have many reasons for treating people at a distance, uh, not just reaching them economically and covering geography, but um, maintaining social distancing during a time like this provides a new urgency for all of this. Um, we got into this area because we ask ourselves, what does the country need that we might be able to help initiate? And one of the things we thought the country needed is to create an environment that would enable health organizations and health systems to adopt uh, digital tools with confidence based on good solid evidence and other requirements that the system would need to uh, ensure were addressed in order to use them safely, for instance, privacy issues. And in creating that kind of an environment, it seemed to us that a, cor a cornerstone place to start was to create a framework outlining protocols for rigorously evaluating digital tools. And when we got into this area, the person that we recruited was Yuri Quintana to lead this. And I'm going to give a kind of a personal introduction to Yuri. Uh, Yuri is Chief of Clinical Informatics at Beth Israel Deaconess uh, Medical Center and Assistant Prof at uh, Harvard Medical School. But what really impressed me about Yuri is I've known him for years. I used to work in the cancer space. And Yuri uh, was recruited by St. Jude's Hospital in the States to scale up high quality pediatric cancer services worldwide. And what he did was created a really interesting community of practice that got people working together using some common metrics and sharing protocols. And, and I'm cutting this very short, but the bottom line was survival rates went from 20% to 50% or more uh, within a decade. And as an organization that's concerned with results, HRI is drawn to the kind of person who has a record of achieving results on that scale. So Yuri has, is now an HRI collaborating scientist and is leading uh, this initiative. And uh, one of the important milestones that he's helped us accomplish is creation of this framework uh, that he's going to be presenting today. And as he's presenting this, I invite you to think uh, about how your work might align with our work. Is there a way that what we're doing and what we have in mind can put wind in your sails to enhance our collective impact or vice versa? Are some of the things that we've got in mind things that you might want to align with, again, to enhance our collective impact? 
Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Yuri. And again, I thank the RBC Foundation for their support for this work. Wouldn't have happened without them. Yuri? Thank you very much, Roy, and to uh, Homewood Research Institute, uh, and also to RBC, and to the many people that have made uh, this possible to get here. Um, I, um, I was born in the U.S., but raised in Canada in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, uh, trained as a computer engineer and a systems engineer at the University of Waterloo, and have spent time both in Canada, U.S., and working globally with different uh, partners. Um, the work I did um, at St. Jude was uh, with a global community of people, and it was really the whole community who built that. And I was able to take knowledge that I had learned from Canada's experience in trying to build a global, a national network of evidence-based medicine. Um, and we did that over seven years, very difficult to do in, um, in, uh, uh, over those seven years. But those lessons learned helped us build this global network um, at, in Memphis. And since then at Harvard, um, I've been building technologies and methodologies for how to disseminate best practices and create collaborative communities of practice. So I'm delighted to be able to work with HRI and find opportunities in which we can connect with others. And I applaud um, the work that Michelle and Paul and others are doing to sort of help advance um, the area of mental health and create a system uh, that not only provides access, but br brings better evidence uh, and quality metrics. So with that, um, let me share with you uh, an overview of the work that we have done in this. Um, and the, uh, the work was the sort of how do we uh, know that apps work and what is the uh, framework or methodology by which we uh, can evaluate. And there's been a lot of good work that has been happening by individual groups and centers uh, around the world. But um, compared to cancer and other areas, there has been less funding in mental health. And so some of the, the studies uh, have not been as large or as wide scale. We also have a new emerging set of technologies that is creating new opportunities, but also potential dangers and misleading applications that maybe do not actually provide the quality of um, results or efficacy that uh, uh, we may expect or need to expect from them. So this is, um, uh, is a formal approach to be able to do it. And what I'm going to do is describe to you uh, why we need uh, a, a framework. There are different frameworks that have already been existed. Why do we need a new one? Um, and um, how can we, um, excuse me here, um, how can we develop um, a better way to be able to improve um, uh, the delivery. And so um, what I'd like to go before we go um, much further is just um, thank again uh, the RBC Foundation who funded this work. And in particular, uh, the, object, the objective of this work was to develop a, a framework um, and then also look at uh, applying that framework uh, to specific apps that were meant for youth. And while this work was initially uh, uh, targeted at youth, the results of this uh, are broadly applicable to um, adults and other behavioral based interventions. Um, this um, framework is a result of work that many people have contributed to in their prior publications and there was a team um, and I want to thank John Torres from the Division of Clinical Informatics who trained in our division and is now one of the leading scientists in this field and contributed to this uh, topic. Um, and uh, there are various other people that were part of the core team and uh, who uh, contributed ideas and text uh, to writing uh, all of this. Uh, I wanna thank Joanna Henderson, who is doing uh, tremendous work in youth hubs uh, in Ontario and collaborating globally. Alex Haddad, who is one of the, my early mentors in evidence-based medicine. Um, and Sarah L uh, Lagan, who works with John Torres. Kimberly O'Brien, who's a leading scientist at Boston Children's doing mental health work. Charles Safran, uh, Safran who is one of my mentors and the former chief of our division. And of course, John Torres, uh, as I've mentioned before, one of the leading scientists in this area. So all of them contributed um, to this uh, framework. And uh, there are various other people that we've also had uh, interactions with um, and have contributed ideas um, 
and themselves are doing great work and we wanna uh, thank them as well. I also wanna thank Dr. Stanley uh, Kucher who provided us with ideas and we've met with him and he has kindly uh, helped disseminate this framework uh, within the Senate of Canada uh, and to other members of parliament and we thank them for bringing attention to this work um, at the federal level. So what do we know about the state of evidence today? Well, there are thousands of app and uh, anywhere from 30, 40 or 50,000, depending on what you consider to be a, a mental health app. Um, but unfortunately, most of these applications do not have formal eva evaluations with objective measures that can be reliably measured. And so the question is, what are those objective measures? How can we reliably uh, assess them? Uh, and what is the process for the scientific evaluation method? Now, there are some existing methods uh, that have been longstanding for developing that. Um, and so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We wanna take uh, methods that already exist and augment them with additional things that are specific uh, to mobile apps and to youth in particular. Uh, it is obvious also that most of the evaluations, some of those evaluations have not been formally peer reviewed and some journals uh, do not have very rigorous standards. There are a lot of new journals that have that accept papers without any sort of serious review. And so just because something appears in a journal doesn't mean that it actually has been uh, put to a rigorous review. And so what we're looking for is evaluations that are rigorous on sound methodology, uh, particularly uh, ones that go beyond 30 days. And while it's important to do an initial evaluation and, and how they're used in the first 30 days, behavioral uh, changes take more than 30 days to, to achieve. And so what are some long-term evaluations? A lot of studies initially, I understand, have to be small at the beginning, but to have a better understanding of how they work over the long term, we need larger sample sizes. And many of these studies are not replicated, and so we don't really have a consistent um, base of body of knowledge to be able to inform sound decisions of what should we use and when should we not use them. Some of these reviews that are out there are also very out of date. Um, and so by the time the review has come up, it could be a year or more since uh, the um, original app was released. And so that information may not be a current reflection of what the app is uh, today. There's also uh, some of these frameworks are not very detailed in what the criteria are and the people applying them may not be fully trained on how to do consistent evaluations. So the evaluation is only as good as how rigorous the criteria are and how well you train the people in doing those kinds of evaluations. And so um, that's another problem. There's also the uh, problem of digital placebo effect. And this is a term that John Torres and colleagues have colleague in that sometimes it's um, uh, when you compare the app to uh, people who are not using the app, um, uh, there may be no benefit when com uh, comparing that. And so that's another sort of uh, problem as well. There is also uh, who, who are you comparing the solution with. And so uh, typically you'll have some people who are using the app and other people who are not your control group. Um, and so uh, if you look at uh, the control group, um, sometimes you can see in the fine details, and so this is one particular study, in the details that those who never uh, engaged with the app had about the same improvements as those who did use the app. And so how you set up the, your study methods are really important and what you're comparing it is really important. Um, and uh, in some cases, those control groups have been instructed not to partake in any mindful activity. And so that might be seen as an unfair comparison uh, with the people who are actually doing the intervention. There's also the problem of how long you follow people up. And so to be able to really understand them if they're useful at a long term, you have to see uh, how uh, people using this intervention have done beyond uh, 30 days. And in some of the studies, they've observed that uh, after three months, there were no significant um, uh, uh, results compared to the intervention. And so I applaud people who are actually reporting those because it's important to show both success stories and, and things that didn't work out so we can learn. Um, but the main message here is that we need longer term uh, studies and those that do not show results, we also need to uh, report on those and try to understand uh, why they're not working. And so ideally, 
we would have rigorous studies um, that would initially look at feasibility, but then sort of um, go into larger sample sizes of 100 or more people um, and have formally structured randomized control trials to have a valid comparisons um, and over time replicate those studies. And if we replicate them enough times, then we can com uh, compare those studies and do systematic reviews and create evidence-based guidelines. And so we've been able to do that in the cancer space and, and other areas. Um, but in the mental health area, uh, there aren't enough studies uh, at this point to really do uh, detailed systematic reviews. There are some, and we're gonna show you some of those. Uh, but in order to get to that stage where we have a greater body of evidence, we're gonna need more funding, more longer term studies, but we also need to agree on what are the metrics that we're using to evaluate um, these and make sure that we're using the appropriate metrics. So the work that Paul and Michelle and others are gonna do uh, and other centers are, is critically important. And I think there's an opportunity for us to sort of as a community to start communicating more about what we're doing and to be able to try to agree on what are the metrics that are appropriate that we should do uh, across these studies so we can have comparison studies. And so if we look at some of these evaluations, and by the way, these reports are on the Homewood website. There's an initial report where we did an environmental scan. Uh, and then there's a second report which has the formal framework. When we looked at some of the evaluations that have been done, uh, and these are some of uh, the ones that are uh, in these papers, we noticed that uh, most control groups are fairly small. And these are some of the more larger uh, control groups uh, that have been used. Uh, but then if you look at uh, the follow-up period, most of them are uh, within 30 days uh, or a few weeks. There's very few that uh, have a study a framework of six months or more. And that might be an artifact of lack of funding, um, but we need to have longer studies to be able to understand um, the outcomes. Uh, there are a few systematic reviews, and so we looked at those. And when you combine these studies, you want to be able to see um, are there studies that have large numbers of uh, participants? Uh, were they randomized control trials? Were those implemented appropriately? And there are uh, frameworks such as the Cochrane Collaboration Framework that allows you to um, structure how you do these uh, systematic reviews so that you can combine the evidence. Uh, and one of those criteria in the Cochrane uh, Collaboration methodology is, for example, how you characterize bias and bias might be unintentional um, problems that you may have introduced into how you operated your uh, evaluation and how you randomize people. And so they have a variety of different criteria for how to uh, evaluate bias and what you want is to have a low bias so it didn't influence the results. And so a lot of studies don't actually measure uh, or report enough information so you can't evaluate their bias. But ideally you'd have that information so you'd have confidence in the evaluation. And then it's important to have a measure of effect size. And one of the effect sizes that uh, is possible to measure is Cohen. And so we looked at how many of those studies had large numbers of people over 100, was a randomized control trial, had low bias, and measured Cohen effect. And if you look on the second to last column, you'll see that there are actually um, no studies at this point that achieve all of those. And so there is preliminary evidence, but to get to the kind of rigorous, um, uh, evidence that we need to be able to do um, better assessments of what works, what doesn't. We're going to have to have more um, subject participants, rigorous randomized control trials. And, and a randomized control isn't always appropriate, but is one of the met metrics um, and to be able to measure the effect size. It's also important to uh, understand what the app is for. And so some apps claim that they work for all ages, for all people at all stages of mental health, and that's clearly not possible. And so uh, in most medical conditions, there are different phases, which uh, are you know, prevention, screening, treatment, uh, maintenance. There are uh, times when there's relapse. And so the question is, at what point, at what stage is the app meant to for what age group and has the app been optimized for that particular audience, that condition at the right stage of it. And so you need to look for that information in the evaluation to see if it's there. 
And also, where does the app uh, connect to? Is it just a standalone app or can, can you refer people to other levels of care? There's some great work going on out of Newfoundland on Step Care, I believe it's Step Care 2.0 now, uh, which looks at how you progress through uh, more advanced services. Um, but the truth is that in mental health and in many other parts of the healthcare, it's a very fragmented system and mental health is particularly fragmented. And so there's either lack of services or services or different provider groups that don't communicate. So the question is, how do we evaluate these apps in the context of a system? And what do we need to do to improve the system so that there is something to connect that app to? So those are sort of the, uh, where we are today in the state of evaluation. And so now I'd like to sort of present to you the actual framework. And it falls in different categories of criteria, uh, which reflect some of the uh, areas that we saw that were missing in, uh, in other evaluations. And, and for each of these criteria, the report gives a very specific definition of what it is, and more importantly, how to go about evaluating it. And we view this as sort of an, uh, the next evolution of frameworks, something with more specificity that could be applied with more rigorous um, consistency, um, but this will evolve over time. And this is sort of the conversation we'd like to have with you uh, in terms of people who are doing similar work and can we collaborate and evolve these uh, so that we have some common metrics and so when we wanna compare our studies, we're able to do that. So the first set of categories is really about um, what is the app uh, and to have transparency of who the intended user are, um, who, who's behind the app and what is their legal owner and what is the funding behind that? Um, how do we know uh, what their true intent is and are they just trying to sort of promote a particular a medication um, or their own particular service uh, or how, what is the actual intent? Uh, what is the cost of that um, and what is, um, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail, but these are sort of what is the app and who is it for? The second set of category is design. How did you go about designing it, evaluating, doing some preliminary evaluations, and there are some formal methods that you can do to do that initial assessment uh, for that and what guided your design of that. Second is, uh, third is sort of how do you evaluate that in terms of operational issues, in terms of security, privacy, confidentiality, and, and what are some of the pitfalls. And assuming that you've got uh, something that uh, meets those criteria, the last two are probably the most critical. So all of these are important, um, um, but without the last two columns, you really don't know if it works. And the first one is sort of a collection of short-term outcome evaluations. Um, and there are specific methods to be able to do. And going back to the original intent about what the app is, are those eva evaluations actually related to what the original objective of those apps are? And finally, then how do we evaluate this over long term and make sure that um, we can replicate these studies and we have confidence that this approach for uh, delivering healthcare with this app um, is can be consistently evaluated. So I'm not going to go into the details of all of this. I'm just going to highlight on a few points of each of those criteria. So um, having a clear intended user is essential. Who's the target audience? who is the legal owner. So if you wanted to complain or you had a suggestion or you wanted to get, uh, is it clear who owns that uh, app and who's gonna take accountability for that? Um, what is the funding uh, source and is there a conflicts of interest uh, between them and how do we um, find out uh, if there are conflicts of interest or not? Um, what's the real cost? You know, it might be free initially, but then uh, to use additional services, are, is there transparency um, in what those costs are. Uh, how often is it updated? So if something hasn't been updated in you know, a couple of years, is it still, uh, does it have current best evidence uh, in terms of content? And how often do they update it? And is there transparency on that? In terms of design criteria, um, um, were cons users ever consulted? Um, and Joanna Henderson and others have been doing, David Wilder and others have done great work in sort of co-designing, and they have some great articles that have been cited in that. Do we take into their, um, uh, the, the use perspective? Um, or are we just giving them what we think they need without ever having that dialogue? Uh, and um, have, we, have we documented uh, what was that co-design process for that app? 
uh, what behavioral model is, and it's just not enough just to say, oh, we're using CBT, you know, what's the details of how you're implementing those models? Um, the devil's in the details of this to be able to know that there is actually some scientific basis for uh, the behavioral based models that they're implementing. Um, there are formal ways to test usability. Um, and we cite uh, those particular evaluations that we think have been well done um, to be able to see if people can actually use it. And, and one important part that I think everyone is struggling, not just in mental health, is how do we personalize these applications? You know, one content doesn't necessarily fit everyone, it doesn't. So how do we leverage the technology to be, uh, and knowledge of that patient uh, or person to be able to personalize the experience of that app and to optimize um, uh, their outcomes? Uh, do we properly consent people for that? Do they know where their uh, data is, uh, how it's being used or reused? Uh, and what ethical principles uh, are there? Charlie Safran, who's uh, within our uh, team uh, was one of the first to be part of a uh, organization called Health on the Net that advocated uh, for transparency uh, for uh, who's behind the information. Uh, and so they, are, they have a set of ethical principles. There are other groups who have other ethical principles as well, but um, do they cite uh, what principles they have? And then who owns that data and can you request that data? And, and a lot of people sometimes say you can access the data, but then uh, do, can you actually test and see whether they give you partially your data or your full data? Um, and so even though there are legislations in different countries that require people to, um, to be able to get their data, in practice, a lot of times that doesn't happen. So you need to be able to test that. Um, security, has there been an independent audit of not only the app, but the organization and where they're house, house, housing that data? And do they show those uh, validated third-party audits? Uh, privacy, does it um, uh, meet the national uh, policies and, um, and local policies for that? And is it written at a level that people can even understand? Most of these privacy policies are so complicated, you don't even know what your rights are. Um, and data sharing, do they disclose who they did, did uh, share their data and can you consent out of that data sh sharing? Uh, what's the true cost of uh, managing this? And, um, and so if you buy it and you wanna use it in your organization, uh, do they later uh, come tell you that you need to buy you know, an enormous uh, infrastructure or it has to be only on the company server? So is there transparency about that? Um, and then interoperability, can you actually export that data into other clinical record systems? There are standards such as FHIR, um, but it's not just the point of just saying uh, we're FHIR compatible, did they actually test? And there are groups, for example, there's groups out of um, Utah that have set up a nonprofit that will do third party independent auditing of FHIR interoperability of apps. And uh, it's not only the communication, but it's, it's also the data formats. If they don't tell you, how your data is formatted, you may never actually be able to, to, to use that. So the, um, so the details of the criteria matter a lot to be able to say if they meet those short-term outcomes. Uh, once they've actually deployed it, have they uh, evaluated the real final product with real users? Have they measured engagement um, and how often people use and what can we learn from that, uh, that user engagement? A lot of apps aren't used beyond the first week because most people don't find value, uh, either because the usability is poor uh, or it doesn't meet their needs. Um, is there a way for users to provide feedback and does anyone ever answer those uh, uh, mails? Do they uh, have, do they have uh, attestation that they've done their due diligence to make sure that the app does no harm? And if they discover that later on that there is a harmful effect, do they pull the app and do they notify people and do they have something to state uh, to that effect. Uh, is there face validity? And John Torres and other, uh, led the development of these, that section of, um, and has written extensively in this topic. Uh, is there, um, uh, are there appropriate um, metrics that uh, address uh, whether the app is uh, addressing what the app is intended to treat? And so how do we, um, uh, how do we know that? And is there transparency? Are, is it the right uh, metrics for that particular um, application? Uh, and what is the dose effect of that? And that's a formal term to be, be able to measure 
um, how much of an effect it has on, uh, on that. Um, and so efficacy becomes uh, uh, an important aspect of that. And so if you can determine that there is efficacy at the sh short term, the next stage is to then evaluate this over a longer period of time. Um, and this would have to be um, beyond 30 days. And there's no clear metric, but uh, typically I think you would have to have something that's in several months. And so we've suggested six months and it might be different depending on different conditions, but there has to be something over a longer term that measures um, what are the, uh, the effects over time and do they diminish over time. Also, if the app is used with other um, services such as face-to-face -face or telemedicine, to what extent did the app contribute to changes and to what extent did the telemedicine face-to-face -face interviews? And so there is a technique called factor analysis where you can measure the relative contribution of different components of the intervention to see what part of the intervention is, um, is helping and in what way. Um, and so I think it's important that as we evolve these apps, um, that these apps connect to other systems, but those eva evaluations are gonna have to be more holistic to be able to account uh, for the different um, complementary services um, and that are being used. And so we need to develop uh, the methodology to do that, but equally we need to build out the system to have those things to be able to connect. And I applaud the work that's being done with youth hubs um, and Cindy Forsyth and uh, many other people are passionate about this area and applaud the work that they're, they're doing in that area. Uh, bias, we've talked about already. Um, and how do we um, uh, evaluate that? And then we need to be able to replicate those studies to be able to see consistency um, in the uh, evaluations. So assuming that we do um, these rigorous evaluations, and we're transparent about reporting these evaluations and show the detail of that, then it can give confidence to other people um, that the solutions that we're building are actually um, effective. And um, I think there is an opportunity for people to collaborate uh, to be able to do it. I think no one has all the resources to be able to do this. This is a very detailed uh, process to do that. And so we need to have a discussion of how we may be able to collaborate. And maybe it's a, a collaboration between different institutions, between different governments to be able to do this in a more rigorous way and to share that knowledge because smaller institutions and smaller provinces will not have the funding level or the expertise necessarily to do this at scale. Um, and why reinvent the wheel when we could uh, find ways of collaborating, which leads us to sort of our final point is how do we move towards an ecosystem where stakeholders can collaborate such that we can continuously improve the quality of mental health services using the digital technologies as a part, but not only part of uh, that, but helps um, advance the field uh, using science as uh, the basis of it um, and not just opinion and best marketing. Um, and how, where do we communicate? How do we structure this conversation? And I applaud, uh, HRI uh, Research Institute and uh, and HRI is a separate group from Homewood Healthcare. There are two separate organizations and HRI has been um, a great catalyst for collaborative um, research across um, Canada uh, and internationally and it's not about owning the space, it's about contributing and being catalysts and so we'd like to have a discussion with everyone for how we may be able to advance that. And so what are some possible next steps? Could we find ways in which we can collaborate and do evaluations together um, and bring our, the best talents from multiple institutions to be able to do some of these systematic reviews um, and also to have a discussion on policy implications, for example, implementation and operational issues of, of privacy and confidentiality and how do we operationalize those in a way that is a win-win for both the consumers uh, the providers as, and as well as not hinder companies, but give them a roadmap for how to use best practices and policy frameworks. Um, how can we learn about these design methodologies and implementation and share those implementations? I know that we have conferences that we attend, but conferences are expensive to go. And now we can't actually go to a lot of conferences. How can we virtually create a community of practice? And this is something sort of I'm passionate about this sort of my main area of work is sort of communities of practice, building the platforms and methodologies to bring us all together. But we need to generate the evidence 
and we need to have a willingness of people to collaborate. And finally, uh, policy, we've talked about policy. How do we not reinvent the wheel, but uh, have a, a national discussion on best practices for policy and how do we um, put those policies into action? So to uh, advance that collaboration, some areas that we could do is to have um, perhaps certain uh, meetings, virtual meetings that we bring together people, for example, who want to talk about metrics and uh, agree on what are the metrics that we should be using. People can have additional metrics, but for the ones that we do agree on, can we define how we collect those and how they're represented so that we can do comparative effectiveness research and compare different in in interventions. For policy, what policies do we have? Where are the gap holes? What do consumers and youth want to see? Um, and how do we create uh, uh, policies um, that are effective and how do we roll them out and implement them? And then there are technical issues of scalability, which is a, a huge problem. Um, and how do we build um, systems uh, that allow us to interconnect this so that it's easier for these systems to, to share data um, when it's, you need to share them with consent of um, the individuals. Uh, but how do we build things at scale so we can have the larger number of uh, people to be able to evaluate these studies at scale. So those are uh, all the slides I had. And uh, I want to uh, thank again the many collaborators who have contributed. Um, I've, even though I've been in the US for the last 15 years, I've maintained contacts with Canadians. Uh, and I think Canada is uniquely poised because they have I think uh, a very collaborative spirit compared to other, other countries. And while you have differences, you have a very civil way in which you discuss things. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for Canada to have global leadership here by bringing together people across the country uh, to work together on common goals. Uh, so I'll pass it uh, back over to you, Roy. Actually, uh, we are actually, not yet. I'm going to actually uh, open it up for discussion first. We have 10 minutes of discussion. Um, and then uh, what I'd like to do is, and I should have actually uh, done this earlier, but I think what, um, uh, if people can, uh, uh, we'd like to open it up for discussion and ask the group to sort of talk about um, what do they think of the um, framework? Um, uh, where do you think uh, we should go forward? What are the uh, ways? Those are some suggestions that I've uh, given of how we could collaborate. Um, what are your suggestions for collaboration? Uh, what do you think are the priority topics that we should be talking about? Um, and so I'd like to open up uh, the, uh, uh, the discussion to everyone. You can put up your hand as well. Um, and so there is a way in the, if you click on the participant panel at the very bottom, there are ways to put up your hand. Um, and you can also go into the chat area uh, and ask to speak and we can, uh, give you the microphone to be able to speak. So um, I invite uh, all the participants, including the panelists, um, to react to, the, um, to this and give your thoughts of uh, what we should be doing going, going forward. So we do have a question from Evangeline um, in the chat box. So the question was, how were youth or other end users involved in the development of this evaluation framework? So the, um, this initial phase of the framework uh, involved uh, people uh, such as Joanna Henderson, who has done collaborative uh, um, co-design work and David Wilger and, um, and we used um, their best practices and, and some of the studies to bring this into uh, the discussion. The next evolution of this is to evolve the framework uh, more. And we recently got a grant um, from uh, the McConnell Foundation to sort of develop, um, refine the, the framework and um, to also uh, work with youth. And we'll be setting up some youth um, uh, groups to talk about uh, what they think is important um, and to be able to um, develop this. We also got a recent grant from the Trilling Foundation um, to involve uh, youth as well. And so we'll be having uh, some group discussions with youth, parents, and providers uh, to discuss what they would like to see in an app and do a second iteration of this uh, framework uh, 
uh, for them to be able to provide um, their, uh, their perspectives uh, for it. But I think it's really important that you need to be at the table uh, in, um, in the evolution of this framework and also in, in the evaluations. And so sometimes we scientists think that we've evaluated things that are important to, that we think are important. Uh, they may not be necessarily things that are important to policymakers or, or youth. And so we need to take everyone's perspectives. So I think great, great question. We had another question in the chat. Um, wondering if any of the apps currently being offered as part of the MindAbility program or MindBeacon have been evaluated using this framework. So our, our goal here was to develop the framework. Uh, we haven't, uh, our next phase is now applying the framework to different uh, apps. So we haven't applied it to any particular um, um, app yet. Um, in some of the apps that we've seen, we've seen people do portions of what's in the framework. We haven't seen an evaluation that has all of it. And so this is sort of an expanded version of the framework. Um, um, but we haven't seen somebody that has all of that. Um, and so our next phase will be to be able to, to do that. And it's an open call to ask people who would like to collaborate, because uh, it takes a lot of effort to do this, um, uh, who want to work together to do these evaluations. I think it's also important to be able to do this um, in, a, in a way that's independent. And so, yes, the developers and the companies can do initial assessments, but there's also uh, a need to have third party independent evaluations um, so that you can have rigorous uh, understanding whether it actually uh, works and avoid any potential conflict of, of interest. The next one, um, the comment, comment and question. So thank you for an excellent talk. My team has been working to evaluate digital health resources for addiction. Do you have any lessons learned in refining evaluation criteria and reliability implementing them? Okay, great. And um, Kaylee, if you can just mention who asked the question so we can, uh, if you, I don't know if you have the name or the organization so we can understand maybe um, what group. And um, so I think uh, consistency is a huge issue. And so the evaluation is only as effective as there is clarity in the criteria, but also in the way in which people understand those criteria and can apply it. And so I've published some systematic reviews um, and it takes a while actually to make sure that people understand the criteria that you're doing uh, and to be able to do it. And so there is a, a method, uh, and this is the next phase of our work, is to sort of uh, test the reliability and consistency of those evaluations. But to do that, you actually need to train people on that. People need to agree, have a common understanding. You go through a period where you do an initial evaluation and, and, and there's a way of comparing th their observations. Um, and so if there is clarity in the criteria and people are properly trained, ideally um, the, the evaluations uh, should be consistent and, and there is a major, uh, way of uh, doing a uh, correlation um, of uh, an analysis of those, those observations. So there is a scientific way to, to evaluate that. Some of the studies that we've shown, um, one of them that I, I showed in the slide, um, there was a lot of inconsistency. And um, I applaud them for reporting that and I'm not trying to critique them. It's just the reality of what they observe, um, but that calls for the need for having a more detailed criteria and people that are uh, very well trained in, in applying those criteria. Next question we have is from Carmen Brown. How do you control for possible lack of consistency in the use of app? For example, the foundation behind the app may work, however, if not used consistently, could not have the desired effect on clients. Do you control for this? Or do you only use data where clients and participants were consistent in their usage? So that's a great question. So I think the, uh, um, one of the criteria there is engagement. And to look at uh, how long people actually use the app um, and then to be able to quantify the effect based on their usage. And so when people start using the app, uh, it could have been usability errors, just it's just hard to use. Um, it may be that uh, their needs have changed uh, or maybe the app doesn't actually meet their, their, their needs. Um, and so um, there are different conclusions that can be derived when people stop using the app. But say if you have a thousand people and 
only 5% of them used it over the 90 day period. And then you have all kinds of different people dropping off during the course of those 90 days. It, it, I think it's uh, incumbent upon the evaluation to look at where did people drop off and what are those reasons to drop off. Um, and so um, lack of consistency of usage is an indicator, um, but there needs to be some methodology for you to inquire and, and to, to evaluate it. Um, if, if somebody stops using the app, uh, it may not be necessarily a bad thing, say if, the, if their condition has improved or um, maybe they, they, they've moved on. And so, um, but in most cases, um, a lot of these conditions require a longer term period and seeing drop-offs is an indicator of something and it requires more an in-depth analysis for that. And so the, the study actually has to have programmed into it uh, a way to follow up with people. And um, uh, most studies, uh, either didn't plan for that and didn't have the funding, but that's important to, to look into. The next question is from Ilana. Thank you, great to see the framework. How do you suggest doing research and collaborating with both private sector and nonprofit sector? How could this framework be applied to private sector apps? So I think, um, I, you know, I think it's important um, that people who are in the private sector look at this as well, and it helps guide how they go about developing their and evaluating their, their frameworks. I encourage them to have more transparency in those evaluations and to uh, seek a third party um, independent evaluation. And I think sometimes there's a problem when we work with some uh, independent, uh, some private sector companies who want to restrict people's ability to report on the results. And so I think to do it fairly, it should be in a way that uh, independent people have full access to all the data, not just part of it, um, and are able to report on, um, on all their findings, even if it's a negative review. And I think a lot of some, com I wouldn't say a lot, but some companies don't want that. You know, they may not want a, a bad report, but you think of drug medications and cancer. Would you want to take a drug that wasn't transparently treated for, um, uh, for beneficial effects and harmful effects? And so if you wouldn't want that of the cancer uh, therapies that you're on or any other therapy, why would you expect anything less from a digital uh, intervention? And so I think there has to be um, a, resp a responsibility that uh, we have transparent evaluations, whether they come from the private sector or the, um, or the non-profit sector. And I think one of the biggest testaments to great work is when other people can independently use your technology and evaluate it and be able to confirm your, your findings. So, um, uh, and I think governments also have a responsibility to be able to, if they're acquiring these technologies for the population, that they um, have these uh, fair uh, evaluations and that, that they are transparent of how they're um, assessing these and endorsing this. And I realize that it's a new emerging field. And again, I applied, uh, applaud the provincial governments who are setting up these centers of excellence to move forward. Um, but we need full transparency in these evaluations um, and not just uh, cherry picking the data or have restrictions on that. Next question is from Evangeline. The evaluation framework is very comprehensive. I was wondering about perhaps expanding the category of bias into equity, considering the current reflections on where systemic racism is embedded in our work. That's a great, great, great question and, and timely too. So um, there is a category in there on ethics um, and what is the ethical framework. And I think um, and while we don't actually um, articulate the point that you made specifically, and I think it would be important to revisit that and to see whether it, uh, it needs to be evolved within the ethics category or have its own category, but um, it's important to look at um, um, whether the app is, um, is equitably um, um, accessible and also whether the, the guidance that comes from that um, app um, is free of bias and, and racism. And so um, I, I think those uh, come driven through ethical uh, principles. And, and I think uh, 
not only should you have a, a sort of framework for ethical, um, how you go about developing an ethical framework, uh, but it's more than just mentioning we have it, it's how did you actually operationalize it, who verified. So the Health on the Net has some uh, principles that they have, for example, uh, and they, they ask you uh, when you um, go up for review for that about how you're actually meeting those principles and you have to be accountable to them. Uh, and so I think that's a really important area. I think technologies also need to be more broadly accessible for all populations. Social determinants of health is one of the, uh, one of the uh, strong uh, indicators of the ability for people to have successful outcomes. And we haven't done enough to sort of take into account social determinants of health of how we develop and disseminate health services. Um, and so I think this, um, this needs to be evolved, but I, I thank you for bringing that up because it's, it's something that needs to be added and articulated and discussed. So we have time for one more question. Um, this question comes from Heather McLaughlin. As service providers rush to implement virtual care within the context of COVID-19, what steps can they take to align with the framework over time? Which steps should be prioritized post-implementation of these services? So um, I, uh, I realized it's sort of a, a moving target and that we all have to accelerate our work out of necessity because of this. Um, I, think, um, I think one of the first parts is sort of realizing that you need some structure for how you're going to be um, evaluating um, your current technologies and your future technologies. And so it, part of it, I think, is mind share and, and getting organizations to buy into the idea that this is important. It requires time and effort and people's time uh, to, to be involved in that. And, and having the leadership of that organization commit people's time to, to look at that. Um, I can't really say one particular one is more important. Certainly privacy and security are really important. Um, but I think just having the organization meet to develop a plan um, and identify which of these are the most important to them. Um, and, and, but among the mix of things that should be in there should certainly be things that are in, um, in that short-term and long-term outcomes area. What is the plan? You need to have some sort of plan uh, to be able to know um, because there's uh, why continue to put time and effort into something that you don't know is actually being effective. And, and, um, and so it begins with uh, organizational commitment to making this a priority um, and making people, uh, make, making sure that people have time to dedicate the, and to upskill their knowledge in the area and to become contributors to this, to this space. So that's all the time we have for questions. We're going to turn it over to Roy Cameron now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Yuri, and thanks to all the participants uh, who engaged. Uh, it was really great to see the back and forth. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, re-extend the invitation to get involved in this, if you see a way that um, you can do that. Um, and what we'd like to do is invite you to get in touch. And if you're getting in touch as an organization, it would be helpful if you could identify a point person who might be the contact. That would really facilitate clear orderly communication. And after this webinar, what we'll be doing is sending you an email asking uh, you to signal your interest. And if it's appropriate, identify a point person from your organization and their contact information. And it would be helpful if you could respond by the end of the week, June 26th. And as Yuri mentioned, we've got a number of follow-up activities in mind. Um, you may have others, but what we have in mind are some uh, things that we think might be both practical and beneficial. Uh, one is to host web meetings and roundtables focused on uh, three areas. Uh, that Yuri outlined, looking at common metrics for collection of outcomes that would allow for comparative outcome research of digital interventions. Um, one focused on uh, policy issues like privacy and data ownership. And a third would be on technical issues like interoperability, network integration, 
Uh, we really think that these are foundational and we envision these discussions leading to tangible products like white papers or short editorial papers for recommendations in the Canadian context. Um, the idea of these papers would be to trigger uh, appropriate action and move things perhaps toward regulation, for example. So uh, that's our, our invitation. And what I'd like to do in wrapping up is uh, a number of things. One is, again, thank the uh, RBC Foundation, Brian, Michelle, Paul, and Yuri for your fabulous contributions. Uh, I also want to remind people who are listening about our other innovation that is actively being uh, uh, scaled up, and that is post-discharge outcomes, post-treatment incomes, the outcomes that Brian and Gene are working with. If you're interested in that, let us know as well. And we're really eager to uh, work together in areas of mutual interest. Um, in thanking Brian and Michelle, I'm thanking people who had to leave early. You may have noticed their pictures disappear. That would, didn't reflect lack of interest. Uh, it reflected prior commitments. So uh, I thank everybody for their participation. I think that this was a very worthwhile session. And I think that we'll know uh, what the true value is when we see the results. This was not just about uh, presenting a, a, a framework but really trying to trigger a community of practice to start engaging with each other uh, to develop uh, an environment in this field uh, that provides people with safe and effective digital tools to provide better access to care. So thank you again to everybody, including all the participants and the RBC Foundation.